Welcome to Censored, number 134. And uh, before we get started, I'd like to read a few uh, scriptures on the front page here. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 He that oppresses the poor to increase his riches, and he that gives to the rich shall surely come to want. Proverbs 22, verse 16. He that makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Proverbs 28, verse 20. As the nail sticks to the stone, so sin sticks to buying and selling. Ecclesiastes 27, verse 22. And now the main article, which is entitled Haters by William J. Eisenman, Ph.D. Why do we care what others think about us? Most of us might like to be liked or admired, and in most cases, that's a good thing. Many times, what others think might help us self-improve or teach us how we should treat others. But listening to others all the time can become a problem. We can place too much value on the opinions of others especially negative opinions. We can take their criticisms to heart, and this can warp our thinking and distort our decision-making and could destroy our confidence and our faith. Today, with the Internet and social media, criticisms seem to be everywhere making some people care too much about how they appear online. These people become obsessive about how many friends they have or how many likes they get. They care about blogs, retweets, likes, and comments. They may agonize about bad or nasty comments they receive. These things can feed insecurities, make one feel bad, even cause depression. If you are bothered by all this, you might want to heed the words of the biblical King Solomon who said, quote, Take no heed unto all the words that are spoken, lest you hear your servant curse you. Ecclesiastes 7, 21. Solomon is here talking about how we respond to criticism. We should not be seeking information about how others view us or how they judge us. We certainly should not be anxious about the evil they may say. We certainly have a right to protect our reputation, however. When we seek comments, we are looking for praise. But we only want to hear good things. We, we want to hear those things that will puff us up, which is vanity. If we are determined to hear what others think of us, it will, in most cases, be bad. It might be better that we don't hear that bad stuff. These things may just upset us. We can't stop people from bad-mouthing, cursing, or criticizing us. So what should we do? Take no heed. Don't take it to heart. Psalm 38, 13 says to be deaf to it. Close your ears. We do not need to hear, I mean we do need to hear, constructive criticism, of course. 
At times, we may need correction or to make changes that will help us grow and become a better person. Constructive criticism is not doing an important video and someone criticizes your tie. What about the content? We should not be interested in gossip or chatter. Opinions may not count here either since they are not always based on fact. If we agonize about opinions, we make molehills into mountains. Solomon also pointed out, quote, Your heart knows that many times you have yourself cursed others. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 22. We have said bad things about others, so... When others say bad things about us, we might want to note our mistakes in this area. It is very easy to say bad things about others, even if we don't really mean them. When we put others down, it can be hurtful. Looking down on others can damage reputation. It is best that when others curse us, that we think about how we have cursed others. In this way, we might not get mad at those who cursed us, but we might get mad at ourselves for cursing others. It can be a learning tool. We can teach ourselves to avoid gossip and unnecessary criticism. In Titus 3, verses 2-3, two, two, the Apostle Paul said to, quote, Speak evil of no man, for we ourselves were sometimes foolish, unquote. We all make mistakes. Judging others comes easy to us. But we should remember that we too can be judged just as easily. Practicing this may require patience because judgments can be wrong or unfair, but it is best to point those who criticize to the content, not the tie. In actuality, we need to be less concerned about what others think and keep working on our self-improvement and doing what is right. Galatians 1 verse 10 says, We should not please men, that it's not always the best. Most of the criticism we get is off the mark, and is heartache and nonsense. Why listen to haters? The end. Welcome to How to Defeat a Conservative, Part 12. Uh, remember uh, this book, as uh, stated at the beginning of this series, was written in the 1990s and um, was not published due to uh, uh, oversights by a lot of publishers. Uh, anyway, this uh, chapter is chapter 8, Porn Made Me Do It, by William J. Eisenman, Ph.D. For years, James Dobson and uh, other conservative propagandists have been trying to convince Americans to accept the quirky notion that pornography causes violence. Shortly before his execution, serial killer Ted Bundy was enlisted by James Dobson to further this effort. 
Dobson and Bundy starred in a video that implied that pornography caused Bundy to become a killer. Actually, Ted Bundy blamed his family, his school, the media, and his progressive, excuse me, repressive religion. Bundy said, I'm not blaming pornography. I take full responsibility for whatever I have done. The video also made it clear that Dobson and Bundy had different definitions of pornography. Bundy's definition included detective magazines and comic books. He also considered the film The Texas Chainsaw Massacre to be pornographic. James Dobson believes that sex between unmarried couples and homosexuality, homosexuality are sinful. As a youngster, Ted Bundy was a Boy Scout, an A student, and he dreamed of becoming a Republican politician in the state of Washington. He once served as the assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee and wrote a pamphlet on the subject of rape prevention. Bundy was the illegitimate son of a Philadelphia department store clerk. His early years were spent with a deranged grandfather who assaulted people, tormented animals, and read pornography. Bundy never defined this pornography. Psychiatrists did not think that Bundy was crazy. He was ruled by an appellate court competent to stand trial. This is ridiculous. It is clear. Americans know little about what is obscene and pornographic and even less about who is sane or crazy. Conservatives believe in the garbage in, garbage out theory. They also regard those below them on the social class scale to be psychologically weak. They believe that anything bad the weak see or hear, they will, in knee-jerk fashion, respond to. Thus, violent pornography will make them violent. Their argument goes something like this. Those who read violent pornography respond to it much as those who read great literature respond to it. But most of us have been exposed to great literature in school. Yet not everyone likes Shakespeare. If this theory had any merit, then all those conservatives on the Mies Commission, after viewing all that porn, are corrupt and violent. It's hard to believe, but some postal inspectors believe that nudist magazines are pornographic. Ted Bundy said he had strong inhibitions against criminal and violent behavior. His neighborhood, church, and school had conditioned him this way. But something happened to change all this. Bundy said that in the early days when he killed, he was nearly always drunk. Alcohol lowers inhibitions. But it is these inhibitions that are the problem. Wilhelm Reich called these inhibitions armoring. With armoring comes secondary drive formations, perverted drives. Violent people lack empathy and can't identify with others. When normal human beings witness the suffering of other humans or animals, they feel for the suffering organism. People like Bundy can't do this. When normal people see violence in movies or a play, they are repulsed. They want it to stop. 
or be directed at the bad guy. This is the simple fact of life. Ted Bundy was emotionally disturbed. Bundy could not feel his victim's fear or pain. He approached none of his victims as equals and rendered them unconscious. Near dead or dead. He treated them as if they were human puppets. In Reichian terms, Bundy was orgasmically impotent and could not have normal, satisfying orgasms. Sex was not Bundy's primary motivation for killing. To Ted Bundy, the most damaging kinds of pornography are those that involve violence and sexual violence. Because the wedding of those two forces brings out the hatred that is just too terrible to describe. This statement comes from one who is seething with malice and hatred. Normal people don't feel like Bundy. Normal people are not fooled by surface behavior. Normal people understand, even if only intuitively, that sex and violence are mutually exclusive. If one is orgastically potent and truly feels for his partner, he could not hurt her. Many of us confuse aggression with violence. We sometimes equate normal erotic aggression with sexual violence. We make the mistake of believing that sadomasochistic acts are indeed acts of violence. To the extent that love enters any relationship, to that extent violence is excluded. Ted Bundy's actions did not unite sex and violence. Bundy dominated and controlled his victims, and not in a sexual context. Rape is a crime of violence. It is an assault, and not sex. Because Bundy was blocked emotionally, his feelings of confidence and potency came from the asexual ability to dominate and control his victims. And none of this has anything to do with pornography. James Dobson and religious conservatives have a hidden agenda when it comes to pornography. They want overworked police to specifically target pornographers. This is a neurotic waste of time and resources. It's the conservatives' religious mysticism or the political fear of the truth that fuels this need for censorship. Pornographers are easy pickings as far as criminals go. Pornographers don't shoot back as do drug dealers and murderers. Mystical religious conservatives have lost sight of the fact that pornography is not the enemy. Real crime is. Repression breeds the opposite of a moral society. So obscenity laws and censorship of pornography will not create a morally healthy society. We need only to look at history. Conservatives lack consistency. They are not always against violence. They are for war and the death penalty. Throughout history, conservatives have often killed those who did not agree with them. 
This is why conservatives must be kept from political power. And their mystical propaganda must always be countered with the truth. Although they will deny it vehemently, it is conservative characterology that will produce a Ted Bundy. This vicious cycle must be broken to stop this warped breeding practice that gives us Ted Bundy's and the women against pornography. Chapter 9, Women Against Pornography. Some women have always disliked pornography. Yet some women attribute women's second-class citizenship in society to pornography. The women against pornography blame women's social inferiority on pornography. They claim pornography portrays women in a bad light and that women are dominated and physically mistreated in pornography. To them, pornography is sexual abuse of women. Women against pornography want the courts to cure men of their women-hating ways. Women Against Pornography was founded in April of 1979 by Susan Brown Miller, the author of Against Our Will, Men, Women, and Rape. In the book, Susan blames rape on pornography. She calls pornography anti-female propaganda. This wrong-headed view of the social plight of women avoids the real feminist issues of economic oppression and abortion. In New York, the women against pornography take women on tours of the porn district. They paste women against pornography stickers on X-rated movie posters and try to shame adult bookstore patrons. The tours are conducted to help women interpret the pornographic images they see. Before the tours, women are shown slides of things the women against pornography believe are pornographic. Women against pornography claim that pornography is a systematic presentation of demeaning and degrading images of women in sexual encounters. This definition applies to hardcore pornography, non-sexual images of women in clothing, advertisements, record albums, cartoons, and television commercials. The belief is that pornography de depicts women as dehumanized, chopped up parts, hunks of meat hanging from magazine racks. The claim is that pornography creates power attitudes toward women. The thinking is that pornography portrays female sexuality in a distorted way. According to Women Against Pornography, wife beating and rape are caused by pornography. Women are treated like sexual objects. To women against pornography, the sex act, sex act is one of dominance and submission. Men are the superior partners and women are inferior objects that can be divided into parts. In Against Our Will, Susan Brown Miller wrote that all men threaten all women with rape. This thinking is neurotic, at least. These are women who are fearful of getting themselves, giving themselves, excuse me, to men 
in a normal sexual relationship. In their minds, to do so would be an admission of inferiority. When we love, we make ourselves vulnerable, we trust. The feelings of inferiority spoken of by the women against pornography can lead to sadistic rage. There is always this proclivity toward violence below the surface in personalities who wish to censor. Susan Brownmiller's violent nature was brought to light when she appeared on the Donahue television show where she said she was glad that Hustler magazine publisher Larry Flint had been shot. She said he should have been killed. In Against Our Will, she wrote about how she learned to hurt men in her karate class. She referred to the penis as a weapon of terror. She said she learned how to fight dirty by kicking men in their balls, and she loved it. Women Against Pornography claim they are not advocating censorship. They say their group is a consciousness-raising one. They simply want people to accept the premise that pornography hurts women. But at the same time, they don't want First Amendment to the Constitution to protect pornography. They want state legislators to decide what can and can't be displayed and they would accept some abridgments of free speech. This is censorship. Norman Jackson, an ex-boyfriend of so Susan Brown Miller, said that she was, quote, a blithering wacko on the subject of rape, unquote. In Against Our Will, it's not at all clear that Brown Miller understood her material. She calls rape a sexual act. Yet throughout the 1970s, feminists finally raised our consciousness and got us to understand that rape is an act of violence. Also, Brown Miller's claim that pornography causes rape is an indication that she lacks basic knowledge of biology. As the work of Wilhelm Reich shows clearly that sex and violence are two antithetical flows of excitation within the organism. With sexual excitation, the body expands. Energy, blood, and fluid flow outward toward the skin surface. Violent behavior causes the body to contract, and energy, blood, and fluids flow inward, away from the skin surface, and excitation is discharged through the muscular system rather than through the orgasm. Sexual impulses become violent impulses as a result of inhibitions. Normal pleasurable expansion and discharge via the genitals is prevented by inhibitions. When the full capacity for sexual gratification is present, no violent or exploitive urges are seen. The rapist and censor are sexually inhibited personalities. Women Against Pornography's definition of pornography is much too broad. It covers sadomasochism as well as advertisements for blue jeans. The women against pornography see perversion, exploitation, and woman hatred everywhere. These women are projecting their own warped life impulses on others and on pornography. They are out of touch with reality, and their arguments are not based on reason. Only conditioned prejudices are expressed. 
liberation and a better life will not be found through censorship and false conservative convictions or principles. Emotionally mature men and women don't go through life fearing words and images. Women Against Pornography have muddled the waters of feminist social goals. Women were second-class citizens in many cultures long before there was such a thing as commercial pornography. Women Against Pornography have made pornography the, rally, the rallying point, but it is not the point. Section 2. Religion as Motivator, Chapter 10, was America founded on Christian principles. And as an aside, let me, uh, let me add that Women Against Pornography is no longer in existence. A good thing in itself. And now to Chapter 10. Most political conservatives believe America was founded on Christian principles. These same people do not believe in separation of church and state. They also believe that America is God-ordained. Let's take a look at history to see if these beliefs are based on fact or mysticism. The Swedes and the Goths visited the shores of America in 996, and they called America Vinland the Good. But the actual history of America begins with Spain in the 1500s. Spain ruled the seas and claimed the Atlantic coast of America by virtue of the bull uh, of Pope Alexander the Sixth. At this time, only Catholics considered themselves to be true Christians. This was the time of the Inquisition, and Spain was religiously intolerant. Spain was interested in America's precious metals and by 1609, Spain had taken $5,000 million worth of gold from America. This wealth was used to kill heretics at home as Spain believed God was on their side through it all. In 1562, the French Huguenots tried to settle in Florida, but the Spanish attacked and killed them. The Spanish believed that God gave them the victory. Nothing could stop the Spanish from spreading their holy gospel through the American continent. Queen Elizabeth of England had no respect for papal bulls. She only recognized claims that were followed by actual possession. Beginning in 1584, the English tried to settle on the Atlantic coast of America in Virginia. These attempts failed, and it became clear that the Spanish Armada had to be defeated before English colonization could succeed. In 1588, the English did defeat the Spanish Armada, and soon Captain Newport reached Cape Henry with 144 colonists who settled on the Jamestown Peninsula. These first settlers came for commercial gain, but they were lazy and had to be driven to survive. During the winter of 1609-1610, the starving time, one colonist was executed for cannibalism. Soon, only 60 colonists remained alive. However, 
In time, 300 more colonists arrived. Yet disease took its toll, and soon only 150 were left. Still, the Virginia colony survived, and by 1615 England was shipping convicts to Virginia. All these settlers were men, and soon there was a demand for unmarried women. It is time now to discover who these colonists were and why they left England. At this time, the Church of England was a state religion, and it was rich and corrupt. One half of the landed property was owned by the Church, which also owned flocks of sheep. Monks issued pardons and indulgences, and fake relics were everywhere. At this time, England was experiencing an economic depression, and there were fuel shortages and crop failures. Englishmen were dishonest, frauds, prone to drunkenness and sexual laxity. Crime ran rampant and was not confined to the abject and desperate poor. Despite all the immorality and vulgarity, it was a religious age. Community life revolved around the church. It was a time of great hypocrisy, and many Englishmen wanted a better life. The Anti-Catholic Act of 1581 made it a felony to write, publish, or distribute any false seditious or slanderous matter to the encouraging, stirring or moving of any insurrection or rebellion in the realm. Under King Henry VIII, Act of Supremacy, all authority over the church rested with the king. To be continued, the end. A welcome to the God Project. This God Project is entitled The Christmas Lie by William J. Eisenman, D.D. The 1944 edition of the Encyclopedia Americana states that Christmas wasn't celebrated in the first centuries of the Christian Church. It was in the fourth century that a feast was established to celebrate Jesus' birth. In the fifth century, the Western Church said it should be celebrated forever on the day of the old Roman feast celebrating the birth of Sol, the Sun God. No one knows Jesus' birthday. But by the 5th century, Christmas had morphed into an official Christian festival. Jesus wasn't born in the winter. Luke 2, verse 8 states, that Jesus was born when the shepherds were in the fields watching over their flocks. This could not have occurred in Judea in December. In that area of the world, the shepherds brought their sheep down from the mountainsides and into corrals no later than the middle of October to protect them from the rains and the cold. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 11, Ezra 10, verses 9 and 13. It was the custom in those days to send the sheep to the deserts and fields in the early spring, about the time of Passover. And they brought them home at the first rain. 
the Adam Clark Commentary, Volume 5, page 370, the New York edition. Brumalia, which ran from December 17th through the 24th, was celebrated as the shortest day of the year and the new sun. This holiday was co-opted by the early Roman Catholic Church. It was a pagan festival, but it became rationalized as the birthday of the Son of God and not the Sun God. It is clear that Christmas is simply sun worship called by another name. Christmas came from the Roman Catholic Church, which got it from paganism. The pagans got Christmas from Babylon. Nimrod was the grandson of Ham, one of the sons of Noah. Nimrod founded the Babylonian system, the system of economics dealing with organized competition and profit-making, the devil's economics. The economic system practiced in America today. Nimrod founded the first kingdom, and it is said that he married his own mother, Semiramis. When he died, she claimed an evergreen tree sprang to life overnight from a dead tree stump. Christmas has nothing to do with the birth of Jesus, the Bible, or God. Christmas is a pagan festival. Does that mean you can't enjoy the season? Not at all. However, you are a hypocrite if you pretend as if it has anything to do with God and you defend the holiday as if it is of God. The birth of Jesus is a secret. Those who believe that Christmas is the birthday of Jesus are ignorant, deluded, or downright stupid. They are vain who would twist and rest the scriptures, that is, rewrite them to make them more in line with their traditions and beliefs. Are not right-wing fundamentalist Christians just doing that with their rewriting of the Bible to make it appear more conservative-friendly? They want the Bible to expound a more get way of life in keeping with their rationalized, greedy philosophy, which is Satan's way of life, the get way of life. The Christmas lie is in keeping with this way of life. The God of the Bible does not accept pagan worship in place of the type of worship he expects. One's traditions cannot override God's laws and be called Christian. Mark 7, verses 7 through 9. A Christian is one who follows Jesus. The End